Hello. These are the source files for a little project I was working on back in 2021. The original goals were to see a simple project through to completion in Unreal to get a better sense of the full pipeline and to test mod support without a full source engine build so you could redistribute just the project without requiring redistributing the editor itself. I think the reason for the J was because it's easier to find console variables when you have a more unique letter. So if I type J here, everything is related to the project. A lot of the code was copied over from unturned and just bulk renamed. One feature that I think is still undocumented is that you can have custom UAT build commands or other UAT scripts uh, in your projects folder, which I think might only be compatible if you have your own build of the engine. In this case, it's a command for creating a copy of the project. The idea was that there could be a custom version of the engine uh, used to work on the pro on the source code of the project and then creating a, a duplicate that was available publicly so that you could mod a game without requiring a full download of the editor. Um, and so that's part of what I was playing around with with this project. In particular, it would have been beneficial for Unturned because then I could allow players to mod it without requiring to release a version of the editor through the Epic Game Store. It does a few things like it excludes any files that can't be redistributed, uh, in this case mentioning sounds, which are also missing from the upload that I'm sharing today. Uh, then we resave the duplicated project to remove references to the removed assets, create a new asset registry, uh, pre-cook all the data so that it's faster to open. And finally, we use this trick to make it so that the uh, engine association is changed to the rocket engine. In order to support loading different maps from mods, the map lists like this one uh, populate them using the asset manager with these level definition assets. They get a GUID which is used for saves, like saving which level you had selected. And they're perhaps a good example of the asset manager API. And then in different cases we scan uh, plugin type mods. So Unreal treats mods as just a plugin that's installed at runtime. And so we gather up their asset paths and scan them. Uh, one note I had here was that we scan them even when they're not going to contain any assets yet, like when you create a new mod, uh, and that way when a level definition is created, it will show up. One feature specifically for this project was multiple slate users, one of which could be the keyboard and mouse user, and maybe this has changed since then, but at the time, the support for multiple slate users in the first place was a little bit work in progress in the engine, um, and so I ended up creating extensions to some of the slight uh, basic types like buttons, checkboxes, and uh, rather than just tracking whether they're being hovered or focused, uh, we have a bit mask for which users are currently focusing it. There's these variables for whether the mouse is currently being used, and so the mouse focus should be drawn, and then consequently only focusing the widget that is being hovered by the mouse user. I remember before going down this rabbit hole of multiplayer local split screen, a lot of tutorials or reference online suggest different places to create widgets. Um, but I found that become and end view target were one of the best places where we create a widget for the player that started watching us if they're a local player controller and we add it to a map so that when they stop viewing us, we can remove it. I found the player camera manager was a really nice place to handle post-processing because rather than creating a global uh, post-processing volume, you can then just add it in apply camera modifiers. And here we're also doing a couple other things like modifying the field of view and setting the per player post-process parameters. This feature seems to have somewhat broken between the versions, uh, but it was the scene probe, which does uh, footsteps and um, like snow displacement and grass displacement and I don't think this is actually worth using because in part because it's probably broken right now, um, but it just creates a capture component pointed down above the player and then different components, well, different actors can register specific components to be drawn into this texture. And, and then this texture is used for things like the grass to check which direction um, it, they should bend. And apparently at the time I decided it was a good idea to test that shuffling the background music doesn't repeat which I feel like there should be a better way of doing this. I would actually be curious to hear if someone can tell me what the correct way to do this would be. You can run these automation tests from window, developer tools, session front end, automation, and then under this project dropdown. So in this case, the pawn collision level has these three tests in it. Yeah, we can start them. 
and I'll just run them in this pop-up window. Did they all pass? Looks like yes. I took a quick look and it looks like the API has improved since then. Uh, the basic idea is still the same in this case. Uh, there's the setting for pawn collision and we want to make sure that if pawns are already overlapping and we change the setting that nothing should happen. And so we have two local players in split screen. We have the setting off by default. And when they spawn, we want to make sure that they're overlapping when they spawned. Uh, then we enable the setting and wait a second. After that time has passed, we want to make sure that they're still overlapping. And then we teleport the second pawn above the first. And then after another short delay, we want to make sure that after teleport and they're no longer overlapping, that the uh, collision is blocked now that the setting has been changed. The movement code is potentially interesting because it supports rollback and multiplayer. Uh, it has a fixed time step. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, it accumulates time until it passes a certain threshold and then uh, simulates a frame and saves a move ID. Then the server can say this move ID was invalid and we want you to re-simulate from there. And so theoretically in multiplayer, it should be seamless. I remember I learned an important lesson here where I always thought cross product of two normal vectors return a normal vector, but that was incorrect. There was something about, I was running into a weird problem before realizing this. Until next time, this has been Nelson.